Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Sky Sports F1 podcast with me, Matt Baker. Joining me for this one is the 2016 Formula One world champion, Nico Rosberg, and broadcaster, Liam McDevitt. Hello to you both. Nico, I'll start with you. How are you? How's your weekend in Hungary? Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, so it's great to uh, great to be on your podcast show here. And um, no, I had a lovely weekend in Hungary. I think it's a, it's a great track. It's a great city. Um, so it was nice to be there. Nice to be part of the Sky Sports F1 team. And it's always good to catch up with all all old uh, teammates and friends and things like that. So I said hi to everybody at the Mercedes team, my mechanics and and journalists. And that's it's always hard lovely. to move you through the paddock, Nico. You're a very popular man when you go to uh, Formula One races. Yeah, even though I mean it's now seven years now since I stopped. It's incredible. It's such a long time ago already. It's unbelievable. I mean, it feels like yesterday. Um, so no, but it's still nice that of course people still appreciate uh, me being there. Um, uh, it does help that I was a, a world champion, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, I think so. Uh, Liam, first time on the podcast. So I'm going to give you the honour of giving us your one word race review for uh, for the Hungarian Grand Prix. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on and pleasure to meet you, Nico. But the word I've gone with, I think, is defining. And it's because Red Bull answered every question they needed to answer. Didn't sit in pole position in qualifying. Even I got bought into the dream of a slightly more competitive race, but Max and Red Bull came up trumps again. So I've gone with defining for the for the race this weekend. Uh, Nico, I don't know if you were briefed before to have a one word race review. So I, I might be putting you on the spot here, but if you were to define that race in one word, what would it be? Um, what would I say? Astonishing or legendary. Let's go with legendary because the Red Bull team broke a legendary historic record of 11 successive race wins by McLaren. Um, they've now got 12. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, that's an incredible milestone. And Verstappen himself is driving in such a legendary way. I mean, he is driving like one of the best five or six of all time, you know, in line, in line with the Senna, Schumacher, Hamilton, um, and two other names. So, uh, fan Joe, and then you start to struggle already. So, it's like, uh, it's it's really yeah, legendary. Couldn't agree more. Um, I've gone for cruising, and that's because of just, I felt like Max was just cruising all of Sunday. A bit like you said, Nico. Um, you know, he never he never looked in doubt. Matt, that's not a cool, that's not a cool one <laughs> word, Matt. Uh, we give you a second chance. I mean, that really sucks. Yeah, you can do better you than got, that, for sure. Yeah, you can okay. do much better than that. All right, your second legendary, chance. astonishing, perfect. Should we call it perfect? It wasn't a perfect weekend, but it was a perfect race for Max Verstappen. I think, yeah. And, and, and what I was going to say, the reason why I was kind of going to go down cruisy, but I'll change it to perfect, is finishing 33 seconds ahead of Lando Norris in second. Um, and, you know, no one seemed to lay a glove on him, basically. As soon as he overtook in that first corner, he was straight into the lead and it never looked in any doubt. So, yeah, all right. And Matt, you, you, think, you think the race weekend was perfect or you think it was I perfect, think it was perfect for, Max? for Max? I think it was perfect for Max. Yeah, I don't know if that's the word you really <laughs> yeah, want to yeah, go yeah. with, but... Yeah, Max performance was yeah, perfect. It really was. Uh, right, here's what's coming up then on the podcast today. We're going to ask the question, can anyone catch Max Verstappen and Red Bull? And when will that happen? We're going to talk about the Red Bull records that, that you alluded to uh, earlier. Uh, McLaren's turnaround, Mercedes getting a bit closer, maybe on Saturday, maybe not on Sunday, and Ricardo's weekend as well. Um, but let's go through some of the records uh, that, that Red Bull have broken this, this, this weekend. So we've already talked about that 12th consecutive win. Um, Red Bull have now won 21 out of the last 22 Grand Prix. Verstappen becomes the fifth driver in history to win seven consecutive races. And they are Alberto Ascari, Michael Schumacher, Sebastian Vettel, and a certain person called Nico Rosberg. So, Nico, I want to start by asking you about your seven wins in a row and tell us how hard it is and therefore how much respect do you have for what Max Verstappen is doing at the moment? Um, yeah, I mean, what an honor to be like in, the, in, in, that, uh, in that sentence as part of that. Uh, seven in a row, yeah, that was quite cool. Um, I would have had eight if, if Lewis wouldn't have shunted me off in Barcelona, <laughs> uh, for those of you. For those of you who remember that race in 2016, um, I'm laughing. By the way, for those of you who can't <laughs> see me now, because that was a joke. That was that was a joke. Um, anyways, um, no, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's incredible, really. To uh, such a such a performance from Max, and I said it in the after race interview with him that I am I'm one of the people that can best judge his performance at the moment and the level that he's driving at. And yes, it doesn't exactly make for the most exciting races uh, at the very front. Um, but I mean, he, it's so deserving because it's incredible. The level that he's at, the, 
so close to perfection all the time. And I mean, you, you got to compare to the teammate. Look where Sergio Perez is. I mean, his best qualifying result in the last six Grand Prix was ninth on the grid. Can you believe with the same car? And Sergio is, is a really good driver. Yeah, we know that. I mean, he's not a, he knows how to drive a racing car. Um, so Max is just extraordinary. Nico, I always, as a fan, I watch those races and watch Max every week. And I think, how do you stay concentrated to the, obviously you're going around corners at ridiculous speeds and it, everything's on a knife edge, but do you ever just sit when you're leading races as often as, as that? And are there, are there ever moments where you really, really need to stay concentrated and remember where you are and the fact you are in a Formula One car leading a race? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, it's, a, it's more a general thing that he generally needs to be careful that he doesn't get complacent because uh, when things start to, I mean, he's in such an incredible flow where no one can touch him. And that's usually when there's a risk of getting complacent and you lose a bit of motivation. Um, so he just needs to be a bit careful of that. But I don't see that happening because the state of mind is phenomenal that he has and um, just he's so focused and so in the zone all the time. Um, it's like uh, it's like art. Mm. It's amazing. Nico, when if you if we look at some of the great partnerships in, in Formula One, I'm thinking Schumacher and Ferrari, for example, is is Verstappen and Red Bull. That is going to become legendary, isn't it? I mean, it already has. But but where do you see that sitting in the history of Formula One? But thank you, Matt, for appreciating my one word to describe the <laughs> race weekend. That's very cool. I like how you picked that up. <laughs> um, so yeah, it is. Um, no, it's a it's a historic pairing. I mean, it's going to be one of those. Um, Epic ones, yeah. We we have Senna with uh, Senna with McLaren. We have Hamilton with Mercedes, and we have and we have Verstappen with Red Bull and, and Schumacher with Ferrari, and then that's that's kind of it. No, I mean you'd have some after that, but it's less clear because um, it's a bit more mixed. So so that's kind of it, you would say, I suppose. Uh, yeah, um, and and no, I mean it's gonna be uh, one of those, I guess, top four that I just mentioned. Liam. If Red Bull, because I think when we asked this question at the start of the season, can Red Bull win every race? We thought, haha, that's a great question to ask Christian Horner after the race. I mean, that won't happen. That can't happen. Now it is looking very possible that Red Bull could win every single race at this Formula One season. If you look at sport more widely, and I'm thinking there's there's plenty of other examples of domination in sport. Where do you think Red Bull winning every race would sit amongst the great sport achievements? Oh, I think it would be up there for me. I had the privilege of sitting down with Thierry Henry recently and he spoke about that invincible season that Arsenal had and the writing on the wall for that season was there the season before and I feel like it's the same with Red Bull you're going into race weekends now and it's almost who can finish second because you know Max as long as he keeps the car on the track is probably going to win and I think it would be up there with the with the great sporting achievements like the invincibles and it would it would certainly for me anyway be on a par with that to go through a whole season with Red Bull winning every race would just be would be incredible. It would be legendary, Nico, <laughs> I think. Here we go again. Yes, we're <laughs> doubling up on this. But it's even more impressive considering that there's only one driver who can win races mm. at the moment. I mean, that makes it even more crazy, the yeah. whole thing. N Nico, when you, were, when you were racing, were you bothered by records? W w will Max be thinking of the next record to come? And, and, and will the whole team be thinking of those records? It really t depends from driver to driver. But I think, I think probably in the end of the day, all of us, uh, are keen on records because it's like part of our legacy. So uh, to this day, I'm proud of this seven race wins that I had in a row. Um, and being being in one sentence there with Max just now, you know, I'm proud of that. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of being a one-time world champion and everything. Look at Michael Schumacher. Remember when he beat, uh, equalized Ayrton Senna's race wins in Monza? Uh, I think he got 41 or 42 race wins and it was equaling Ayrton Senna and he broke out in tears. Um, so... It does mean something to everybody, and I'm sure it means something even to Max. And uh, he's there. I mean, he's on it to break uh, many of them. I feel like it's a way of quantifying what you're achieving, isn't it? If you look at people you either aspire to be like or people you compete against, if your records are better than theirs, it's a way of quantifying what you've just achieved. And I think he'll definitely be looking at those those records, and Red Bull will be will, will be wanting to do it. I think if they can keep a car on track the whole season, I can't see anyone beating Max mm -hmm. at all. Uh, I've got a tweet here from Dan. Uh, this is sort of directed to you, Nico. What's the difference between Mercedes dominating era compared to Red Bull's domination now? And do you think it's now much more predictable that Red Bull would win compared maybe with when Mercedes were dominating? I don't really know what the difference was because we were just as dominant um, as Red Bull is now. 
I mean, we were getting all the pole positions, all the race wins. It was just when we were messing up and having some some crashes between the two of us or or reliability concerns um, because it was the first it, it was the beginning of the hybrid era. So at the time there was more reliability concerns in the cars and in the in the power uh, powertrains. Um, I think probably that's the only difference, really, just more reliability struggle at the time. If not, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. Another question, and this is on the the Sergio Perez question, really, because you know it was it, it was a what started as a very diff difficult weekend for Sergio. Um, he started P nine, or sorry, he had the crash in FP one first of all, which was obviously not the not the start he wanted uh, to, to the weekend. But he went from P nine in the race to, to to finish on the podium in, in third. Um, Cameron on Twitter would like to know what lessons could Checo learn from your approach in 2016 when it comes to beating an un unbeatable in inverted commas teammate. What would you, if you were Sergio Perez's coach or manager, be saying to him now about dealing with dealing with Max Verstappen? Well, I mean, first of all, I would recommend to Sergio to really switch off all the media and everything, um, not look at social media because he's going to be getting he's going to be seeing so many memes going against him, comments going against him, journalists uh, giving questions that are going against him, you know. So you really need to separate yourself from that. So what I switched off my entire social media email news world and completely for the last six years when I was fighting for the championship. The only problem is that he still has to go to the racetrack and on a Thursday he has to sit in front of 50 journalists and they're going to ask him, hey Sergio, you're looking like you're having the biggest struggle in your career. Do you think you're ever going to get out of this again? You know, this is the journalist asking. And that, it always hits you. It always hits you because you have to listen. You can't ignore. You have to answer the questions. Um, and the next question is going to be, hey, Sergio, uh, is, do you feel the threat from Daniel Ricciardo? Do you feel that you might lose your seat? You know, that's the next question from the journalist, you know. And it just goes on and on like that. And it's, it's so hard because it just keeps on hitting you in your head. Um, and that's... That's like one of the hardest parts of the weekend for Sergio at the moment um, to deal with. And so really it's about switching off, focusing. Also in his state of mind, um, he was very focused on, hey, I want to beat Max, I want to beat Max, I want to be champion. You know, he's always saying, I want to be champion in the winter. And it's time to, I mean, he's doing it anyways, but just, just forget about that and just race weekend by race weekend, come to the race and session by session, do a fantastic job. Prepare for it as best you can. Risk manage out there and just do a fantastic job and rebuild like that. Um, that's uh, that's what it's about. Um, that's what he needs to try and do. Yeah, I think if you look at how he was, how he opened the season was he clearly had that winter where he was talking about being champion in the first few races. Didn't have that level of distraction that perhaps we see now, and maybe that's where the complacency and, and inconsistency is perhaps creeping in. It's very difficult to explain huh, how his season has nosedived in the way that it has because he had some really strong showings um, earlier yeah, in the year. Yeah. Um, it's impossible. It's impossible really to say. But we've seen that so often huh, with sports, uh, especially also Formula One drivers, that they just get this hit this patch of like really poor form. And um, I mean, Sergio is not really. I mean, imagine five races in a row not in Q3 with a Red Bull car, like, and then ninth on the grid now in Hungary. Like, wow, that's a that's a, that's quite a struggle, you know. So. Um, but the day like yesterday is really going to help him a lot. And, uh, and he confirmed that in the post-race interviews with me. He was like, yeah, this is really the perfect race to rebuild mm -hmm. my confidence. Mm -hmm. Liam, do you, do you think actually what Sergio is doing at the moment is kind of, it's not really bothering Red Bull because actually Red Bull could be leading the uh, Constructors' Championship just with, with Max's points by himself. So, you know, we, we know how difficult that Red Bull seat is to, to find a good, a good match for that, for that second driver to Max Verstappen. So would you, would you say perhaps actually... The only person this is harming, really, is Sergio Perez. It's not harming Red Bull. Yeah, completely. I think if you look at previous seasons where they've needed someone to maybe help Max from a charge in Lewis Hamilton or a bit more competition at the minute, Max is so far ahead. They don't need uh, a second driver to maybe play team. So if you are under, under fire for your seat, then Red Bull are in a position where they can afford, like you said, to just have Max out leading up front. They don't need someone else who's applying pressure or... Uh, potentially slowing up another driver who's on a charge. So, yeah, for for Perez, I think it's it's going to be really interesting how uh, he comes back after the break. If he maybe he needs that break just to to have a bit of downtime and 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 come back in the second half of this season and and put some performances that might just keep him in his in his seat. Because what's what's next? Spa, yeah, right? Spa this, this weekend? weekend, and then we've got the break. The problem is Spa is like going to be the ultimate Max Verstappen track again. I'm I'm sure. I mean, he's it's really a driver's track where you can make such a difference if you're like dialed in and you're in the zone. 
and I feel that he's going to be killing it this weekend. Like, and you, it's so difficult for a, a driver when you start to come to the realization that hey, this guy does things that I will never be able to do in my life, and you just keep looking at it all weekend, and you see these things in the data. Um, and of course, I had these moments with Lewis. Uh, fortunately, they didn't last too long, but. But uh, there was always these moments where I look at the data, I'm like, there's no way I would be able to do this. Like, this is like inhuman. It's not even human <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, and, and that's what Sergio will be looking at with, uh, with Max Verstappen. And that's, it's tough. It's really tough to accept that, you know, that, that um, they, he's just able to do something that I'm not. You know, it's, it's really uh, mm. not easy. What about, what about that summer break, Nico, when, when you were racing? Was that a period? I guess it depended on how the season was going, right? But if... Was was that a period where you just needed that that time that that time to switch off to reset and to go again for the second half of the season? Yeah, it's very valuable um, to have that summer break and just really recharge with your family and friends. You know, go with family and friends, spend a lot of time. <coughs> tell them not to mention the word Formula <laughs> One. That's important, which is often difficult because it carries over into the into the family. Um, I mean, you know, I would come home and my my, and my father or father-in-law would tell me, hey, I should pick up boxing. <laughs> yeah, and the reason was because Lewis was walking all over me the day before in the race, you know? So so my father-in-law or my father then tells me I should pick up boxing when I come home. I'm like, do you know how painful that is to hear? <laughs> like, oh my God, you know? It's like, it's like they're telling me to grow a pair of balls, you know? Like, oh my goodness, that's horrible. So it like goes all the way into your family. So that's why it's like F1 top yeah. ban on the family and just uh, recharge. But a fascinating insight into your summer holidays, Nico. Yeah, I like that story. That's a good one. <laughs> um, all right, let's let's move on to, to talk about McLaren because obviously McLaren, the last couple of races, Silverstone and now Hungary, have performed exceptionally well. I think we were both waiting for Hungary to, to see if 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 it was just a Silverstone thing, the lower temperatures, the, the the specific type of track. But Nico, if McLaren can do it at Silverstone and at Hungary, is this car the real deal? The McLaren car is the real deal. That's confirmed now. Um, of course, there's a very extreme track change now to to a Spa, um, but but we've seen how rapid the McLaren is on the straights, so it should be fine there as well. And it's I mean it, it's it's such a impressive technical development that they've done during a season that's so unusual for a team to make such a massive jump. I mean, from like 13th to second, like it's incredible what they've uh, and they're they're challenging for the the race win now. I mean, it's coming, it's coming that race win, you know. And, and Lando is like a champion in the making. Yeah, he's uh, world class. He's he's incredible as a as a young driver. Um, so uh, unbe unbelievable what they've done. I hope they understand it 100% themselves. Sometimes I'm not too sure if they really understand everything because these aerodynamics, you know, are just so complex with the under underground uh, with the ground effect. It's very very difficult to to fully understand in the wind tunnel. It's much more easy to see flow on top of a car than underneath. Because underneath, then it also changes so much with angle and with with ride height. You know, there's very very rapid effects going on there. So um, yeah, but if they do understand it 100, percent it's uh, phenomenal. And they don't even have their their new wind mm. tunnel up and running. You know, they're still using their old old wind tunnel, which we know has its massive limitations. So wow, uh, mm. incredible. Liam, how good is is it now for Formula One to have another person at the front, and particularly Lando Norris, who is. I, I, I mean, I was standing under the podium yesterday. I think he got the biggest cheer out of certainly from Verstappen and Perez. It was all for Lando. I think like Hamilton, when he came out for the for the driver's parade, got a massive cheer equal to Lando's. But he probably is one of the most popular drivers on the grid at the moment. Yeah, Lando mania is real. Honestly, a lot of my friends who are new Formula One fans, it's all about Lando Norris. And to see him and McLaren back near the front of F1 is is good for for everyone who, who watches and, and all involved. It's just... I don't know if they can close that gap on Red Bull like Nico said. I'd love them to. Uh, and I think the jump that they have made this season is already incredible. But to have um, another team competing for that po those podium spots, is it, at least it makes for, for some overtaking behind Max. No, I, I can confirm that. I, when I, again, post-race post interviews, I mean, the cheer from the crowd when Lando was coming up to talk was just uh, massive. So he's so much support he has. It's really amazing to see. And I hope it's not... It, it can be a bit overwhelming sometimes also uh, for a young driver to have so much attention and so much support because F1 has taken on dimensions now that didn't used to have like uh, five, seven years ago. Um, I mean, there's the people like under your hotel uh, that you can't even get out anymore, even uh, at your home, wherever they're living, you know. So it's really it's really going quite extreme. 
uh, I was speaking to Toto uh, at the race weekend. He said, no, I'm not coming to Ibiza because it's just paparazzi nuts. Uh, I, I need to go somewhere where nobody can find me, you know, for the for the summer holidays because everything's going out of control. So, uh, so I, I'm, yeah, so I hope Lando uh, manages to cope with all that um, that attention. Also, Oscar Piastri, he's putting in really solid performances and I guess the excitement of Lando double podium is is easy to focus on but Piastri's driving like someone who's much more experienced than he, than he is in in his seat in McLaren yeah you're right um it's like this crucial phase and opportunity for a rookie um Piastri now suddenly has that good car and it's now he has these couple of races where it's his moment where he needs to put a marker down as a rookie that I'm here to stay and he's doing exactly that perfectly, like so perfect. He's shadowing, shadowing Lando, just uh, just right behind him always, like one tenth, two tenths, couple of tenths behind him, always there. If Lando's second, Oscar's third. Even in Hungary now, he was one place in front after the start, so he's doing a perfect job. He did. Uh, we did see some weaknesses then from him in in Hungary, and we saw the same ones in in Silverstone actually. That he's still struggling a little bit with tire management and race pace throughout the whole race. Um, but let's not underestimate. I mean, it's so so difficult to get that right. Uh, so experience helps a lot there, and Oscar, uh, it really looks like that he's the real deal, and uh, and he's here to stay, which is uh, which is awesome. Yeah, this is a man who didn't race last year. <laughs> he just now is back in Formula One after after not being in a car for a whole year. Um, Nico, what about Lando's contract until twenty twenty five? I think at the start of the season, when when McLaren were were often not getting out of Q one. There were a lot of people saying, wow, I mean, that contract, how watertight is it? Because if you're Lando Norris, you're wanting to get out of that potentially pretty sharpish if the McLaren isn't as good as that. Now, it's maybe starting to look a little bit like, actually, till 2025, that might be the right kind of timescale for that car to get to the front of the grid. Yeah, I mean, in general, I'm not sure that was the right decision um, of him to lock himself into a McLaren for, for so long. Um, but uh, but but of course now in hindsight uh, you can always say it was the right decision because now the car has come alive the team is coming alive so now it's all good obviously because he can challenge for race podiums every weekend and and go for the race win very soon so um, now you can say everything is done correctly and and now he won't mind that contract being long because McLaren is an awesome team and um, and with the way it's going uh, he's in a super fantastic position there so um, why mm. not. Mm. Liam, uh, you, you you start to work a little bit with with McLaren over the over the coming months. I mean, what what's the mood like in the McLaren team at the moment? What's the atmosphere like? I mean, if you get a couple of good results like this, I imagine it turns turns the team around. Well, we had a little party after qualifying at Silverstone, um, which was which was incredible. It just seems like every the hard work is is finally starting to pay off, and I don't know how you couldn't celebrate the results you're getting. But it really feels when you're near Lando and Oscar up close, they seem to be a team they seem to get on well and I think that that can help and is important so I mean how could you not be happy at McLaren right now with the results and the, the upgrades that they've put in have clearly had a massive impact so hopefully it, it can continue throughout the throughout the rest of the season uh, I've got a question here from uh, always f1 on Twitter Nico do you think McLaren can finish second in the constructors championship if they keep getting podiums or will other teams eventually catch them Second is maybe, I mean, that's probably a little bit far. I mean, that, that would mean Mercedes are on 223 uh, and then McLaren are on 87. So it would have to take a lot of points away from Mercedes. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. yeah, no, that's not going to work out, but they're going to catch up rapidly. Um, but but when McLaren finish second and third, Mercedes is going to finish fourth and fifth. So it's going to be difficult to make up that huge difference. Um, but I, I don't know who's, I mean, who's, who, what, what's the next ones there? I mean, there's Aston and Ferrari. I don't know if they can catch one of those maybe, but even they are going to be pretty far up the road, aren't they? Uh, maybe Aston, Aston, because at the moment they only have one driver who's really getting bigger points, even though even in last race, they both didn't get many points. Um, perhaps they can catch Aston. Nico, would you rather be sat in a McLaren or a Mercedes for the rest <laughs> of the season? Well, uh, Mercedes, come on, because that's my home, <laughs> that's my team, it's my... It's my ex-family, so I'll go for Mercedes. Yeah, why not? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that was a very, a very good question. <laughs> Let's move on to talk about Mercedes, speaking of, because um, it was a weekend of mixed fortunes, wasn't it, for, for your old team, Nico? Let's t start with the positives. That poll for Hamilton on Saturday, you could see how much it meant to, to him. What do you think that did for, for Lewis in terms of his energy and moving forward, n feeling like the team are going in the right direction? Yeah, I mean... Um... I mean, I, I've witnessed that that greatness many, many times in my career, sitting in the same car as him. 
And and on Sunday, no, on Saturday, that was one of those very, very special moments where nobody in the world could c even come close to a lap like that that Lewis did uh, with that car. I mean, it was uh, similarly to Max being in inhuman in general, then Lewis was inhuman, inhuman on the Saturday there on his on one of his favorite tracks. You know, it's just uh, the way he goes on this track is is unreal, and that's why I was so sure because he he's done it before so many times that. He just makes the impossible possible by, by then winning with a car that's actually not supposed to be winning, especially on a track like Hungary. So I was actually really thinking he's going to win it on Sunday. Um, and we saw a really rare, rare, like, string of mistakes from him. Huh? Messing up the start, messing up turn one, messing up turn two, and just giving up another position to Lando, just drove around the outside of him, you know? So, um, it, or was it inside? No, I think outside, huh? I'm not sure. Can't remember. Uh, anyway, so that was very unusual. But um, but uh, back to the question. What was the question? Uh, it the was question a case was? of how how that result has, has will, will impact Lewis going forward. You know, into the into the second half oh, yeah, of the yeah. season. Oh no no no! It's huge. I mean, for motivation, it's huge for the whole team because you start to believe again. Hey, we can be on pole. We can win races very soon. Uh, just gives you this belief back, and that that will be a, such a motivational booster. Um, so. So I think it's a great thing. And who knows, maybe it can also make that difference in the contract negotiations, mm. you know, that he's having with Toto. Because um, it's it's different, you know, when you start to believe again that the t Toto and the team can actually give you a car where you have a chance to win races and perhaps go for another championship. It will be a big different a difference uh, in, your, in your state of mind than to actually putting pen to paper and signing a contract where, who knows, maybe there's uh, a couple of million less than you're <laughs> hoping for or something like that. I don't, I don't know, obviously, anything, but uh, m maybe that's something. Liam, what, what what did you make of make of Lewis's pole? How excited were you at the prospects of Lewis being on pole and potentially going on to win the race? I mean, Lewis Hamilton is the whole reason I ever got into Formula One many many years ago when he was in a McLaren. So I was I bought into like Nico. I thought Sunday was going to be a a Lewis special and he was going to go and and at least compete for for longer. So I mean, it's great to see them. Great to see you can see the emotion uh, which we kind of haven't seen too often in in recent times from Lewis so that was nice to see um and I uh, you see uh, Nico will know better than me but it, it seems like he's a really hard worker and that pole might just be a little bit of fire that he needs to hopefully go and go and put some some quicker laps down throughout the rest of the season but for me it was amazing to see to see uh, Lewis Mercedes on the start of the grid on a Sunday but just a shame <laughs> He was he was back and forth after yeah. the first few corners. It didn't last very long, did it? Did it that hope? Do you, Nico? Do you think we were almost robbed of that um, that that battle, that wheel to wheel battle between Max and Lewis going into turn one? You know, obviously we had it into turn one, but it was a pretty it was over pretty quickly, wasn't it? And I think it was such a shame it didn't at least give us a few more laps of, of that battle. Yeah, I mean, it was really such a <laughs> such a letdown. Really, um, I was so excited, and then. And I saw that happening. I was like, "Oh no! Come on, that's not that's not cool." Like, um, uh, yeah. So that was uh, that was unfortunate for us uh, for us F1 fans. But there was a wheel to wheel battle going into turn one because Max Max purposefully run ran Lewis out wide. I mean, uh, he he just you know didn't even try to get the apex. Um, so there was a bit of a, a battle there, but Lewis had couldn't do anything on the outside. Once he tried to decide to go round the outside of Verstappen. So probably Lewis should have just backed out of it or something and try and tuck in mm. behind. Mm. I think there's a there's a big part of all F1 fans who just want to relive those former seasons of Max versus Lewis and Lewis versus Max every week and any yeah, of course. any any hint of that and it's uh it, it, you can easily get lulled into being excited but yeah just wasn't there Sunday. Of course because Lewis is uh, historically one of the best ever in wheel to wheel racing and then arrived this new charger who did like incredible things in wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, which even took Lewis by surprise in a way. Uh, we never witnessed this kind of level before, you know? So, so uh, it, to see Lewis then fighting back is just so cool, you know? And we all want to see, uh, see more of that. Don't realize how lucky we were in, in 2021 to see that kind of weekend in, weekend out. Uh, Nico, do you, do you sympathize with Lewis and his lack of confidence in the car? It seems like that's kind of the, in quotes, after, after race weekends, that's, that seems to be the problem. What is it like as a driver when you don't have confidence in the machinery underneath you? Well, I don't know if we should, um, if we should uh, put too much weight on those comments. Um, I'm not sure, but of course, sometimes it can go that way. That things that the car just isn't uh, completely to your liking, and and it's not a quick change. It's never a quick change. Then it's probably uh, waiting till the next year kind of thing usually. Um, but 
but it's it's rare and usually you can work your way around it and and i think sometimes lewis uh, uh yeah um like like this friday in hungary where he said uh, we're struggling so much the car is so far off <laughs> and then he goes and yeah. gets pole position yeah. you know maybe we, maybe we shouldn't put too much weighting into that and and let's remember that that he's doing such a great job against george who's also potentially a future world champion with what we've seen from him but isn't it amazing how how it's just swings and roundabouts like last year george was having the better run better luck and and beat lewis over a season and this year everything is going against george every moment on every race weekend it's always going against george so it's just the complete opposite and then this year lewis is gonna have have uh, george under control in the championship you know but but what a great recovery drive from george you know, from 18 coming back to six was again like in, was such a such a fantastic drive um really really well done mm -hmm. Uh, Liam, are you to, I guess when when we first entered 2022, and we we were we were kind of every weekend that Mercedes weren't up right at the very top was a shock. And are we now in a situation with Mercedes where it's kind of like, oh well, you know they are just kind of operating in the midfield at the moment. Be, being honest, it, it's it's hard for them to get out of the midfield. It's no longer a shock, say when when they end up P4, P5, P6. Yeah, completely. I wanted after the, the end of the season success they had, I thought the gap would be much closer and I did think originally at the start of the season that the early results were just a blip but I think you showed the car revealed its its true pace on on Sunday uh, obviously it came back when it had a lighter fuel load in the end but I just think it's where Mercedes are McLaren have obviously made the jumps they had and if she it's kind of like if Mercedes can get on the podium consistently that seems like success at the minute and obviously that's not what so many F1 fans are used to over the last six seven eight mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. Um, I wonder. Well, I wonder what that is that the Mercedes car can fairly well like cope with uh, one lap pace or low fuel pace, and then when it's heavy, just be so far off. Um, I wonder. I wonder what that is. Some head scratching at uh, at Mercedes HQ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a tweet here from Stephanie uh, during the Hungarian Grand Prix. Uh, this is to you, Nico. Sorry, you said Lewis isn't done with F1 yet. How long do you think he can and wants to go on? Well, because Martin Brundle said we're seeing the handing over the, of the baton from uh, from Lewis to Lando, and I was like, whoa, whoa, hang on a second, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and it's it's impossible to to say how long. I mean, if if he's enjoying himself and he still feels motivated and and believes that he can still uh, have a car to win races, um, and he's earning, I mean, who knows, uh, 40, 50 million a year plus, whatever. Um, then yeah, if there's possible they will still do many years huh? yeah. why not i mean look at fernando fernando is 42 and is still world cla world class i mean the way he's driving is still uh incredible so um so yeah yeah who knows yeah uh, i mean liam how long would you like to see lewis go on for i'd obviously love to see him in a position to compete for uh, an eighth uh that would be for me something that i'd i'd love to see he's the reason i love f1 and to see him again be close to being crowned a world champion would be would be amazing but at the minute I just uh the, that dream of an eighth is is for me fading and fading away and and hopefully mercedes can can pull it together and at least get him a car that can compete with with red bull and uh, and mclaren if they keep improving the way they do yeah because even for next year even for next year now it's starting to be difficult because in the in the post race interview with christian horner he said that the red bull team is now putting 100% focus already on next year they're not developing this year's car anymore um, so uh, Mercedes at the very least has to do that as well to have a fighting chance against Red Bull next year but it's just it, it becomes such a long game you know in F1 it's very difficult to there's catch no up. guarantees are there that next year the, that Mercedes will be able to give Lewis a car to, to go for eight no 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 yeah. not at all uh, right the fi final kind of big big topic I want to get into is just Ricardo's weekend obviously his his first weekend back uh, in Formula 1 this season replacing Nick De Vries at Alpha Tauri uh, Nico, start with you. Give us some marks out of 10 for how you think Daniel's weekend was. It's really difficult to judge. I think in general you would say 9. Maybe you would even give him a 10. I don't know. The thing is I, I'm not able to judge his, his race in itself because he got he got shunted from behind and then as a result he crashed out the two Alpines, which was not his fault. And um, after that I, I really don't know what he was doing pace-wise, but... Uh, Liam, do you know uh, any idea? <laughs> no, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I was, uh, but, too, too focused at the front, but it's great to he, see him back. We yeah. all love a we love a Ricardo uh, in an F1 car. He did finish 13th and well ahead yeah. of Tsunoda and everything, so maybe his pace was uh, was good. Um, but anyways, already his qualifying pace was uh, 
was was really um way I mean really strong because beating Sonoda first time back is is really strong in a car that you've never driven before um with very little running the day before you know that's wow that's the ultimate challenge so super and it's so nice for all of us that he's back um we love uh, watching Daniel Ricardo you know he's such a such a warrior on the racetrack and and um Christian Horner was saying that a happy Daniel Ricciardo is a fast Daniel Ricciardo, mm. and I'm seeing him very happy at the moment. The pressure and expectation is not really getting to him, um, which is uh, so he seems to be in a good place. And maybe then we can see a different Daniel Ricciardo and see the old Daniel Ricciardo again. You know, who is incredibly fast and talented. When I saw he was going to be back in back in F1, and then the Red Bull rumor mill started, I kind of wondered what he'd have to do for the remainder of the season to put forward a good enough argument to get a seat at Red Bull. I don't know what success for Danny Ricciardo looks like this season. Well, it's going to be really dominating Tsunoda. Yeah. Um, it's going to be getting some getting some points, some strong races. Um, and then then, he, and then, it, then it depends on Perez also. If Perez continues this difficult form, then, then there could be a chance. But it's, it's going to be a big ask. But anyway, I think Daniel made a bit of a mistake to mention that interest in going back to Red Bull Racing. Because it just adds... The whole focus now on him is like, is he going to manage yeah, to do this? Yeah. And it, it's all about that. And it shouldn't be. It should be about him just racing for Alpha Tauri and, and trying to do a good job. That, that's it. So it was, it was, it's a mistake for him to, to put so much focus on, uh, I'm only here because I want to get back to Red Bull Racing. Um, that's a big lesson that I learned in my career. You know, that a total unnecessary extra pressure. It gives us some extra jeopardy to talk about, though, doesn't totally, it? Totally, because yeah, <laughs> you're good. No, because yeah, because you're you're gonna rate him on based on that. Was yeah. was Sunday good enough to get him back to Red Bull Racing? That's all what it's about now, and and that's not good. That's not healthy. Getting in that car halfway through the season, having not even tested in that car, was this weekend. Do you think a lot about just kind of getting comfortable, understanding that Alpha Tauri, and getting the setup right in order for maybe then. Belgium might be a slightly even better thought for him because I guess he'll spend what all week in the factory this week working on the setup, working on the car to make sure it's as good as it can be for him. Yeah, uh, I mean he's a race winner in uh, in Belgium as well, so it's a track he goes well at, and because uh, he beat me there, I remember that. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Hungary, I think, was really about also getting the the small things right, like even just your brake pedal feel, because some drivers will like really hard brake pedal, some drivers will like soft brake pedal. Um, and even that can make a huge difference then on your performance. So um, a lot of, I think a lot of fine tuning in, just for driver comfort will have happened in, in Hungary for him. And, and um, that's why there's much more to come from him once he settles in into the car and feels comfortable and has a comfortable seat and position and steering wheel and everything. Um, so it was a good mm, start. Mm. Liam, I'm intrigued to get your thoughts. Uh, and this is actually a question from Stephanie on Twitter. How much time should F1 rookies get to prove themselves? And uh, uh, you, yourself, you're a, you're a professional footballer. And imagine if you, I don't know what, I don't know what 10 races is in football terms. I'm going to, let's, should we say six months? Imagine you get six months, yeah, half, half a season. season to prove your worth. It's, it's brutal, isn't it? Well, it's brutal in the sense that there's, there's, it's so unforgiving F1 it's hard to draw a comparison with football because I guess the ruthlessness of it if you if you don't take your chance and you're you need to be in that top elite elite group of people in the world who get to sit in a F1 car uh, I'd like to think you'd need a season to get get used to everything and the the new surroundings because you see the jump the jump up is is so vast and so massive I'd I'd like to think you'd get a season but when you're dealing with the very top percentage of elite sport you can understand how decisions are made as as ruthlessly or as quickly as they are. What, what do you think, Nico? You think he's been hard done by, or or you think you need a season to to kind of really understand what you need to be a top F one driver? Christian Order said, "We're only interested in Nick if he looks to be like the world class we're looking for to potentially come to Red Bull Racing." Um, and and they came to the conclusion that yes, Nick can be a great Formula One racer or whatever but he'll just never be what we're looking for to, to potentially have him in Red Bull Racing. And then it's just not of interest for us. And we have this opportunity with Ricciardo at the same time. I mean, certainly that was decisive in the decision to release Nick. If it wasn't for Ricciardo there, Nick uh, surely would have finished the season. Um, but there was that opportunity to put Daniel back in the car and evaluate him if perhaps they could find uh, the old Daniel once again and not the Daniel they saw at McLaren. Um, which would be very exciting for Red Bull as a whole because, of course, Daniel is huge personality and, and was a huge driver, you know. So I think it was a combination. And it was very harsh on Nick because 
to get kicked out of your dream. Uh, for Nick, uh, for Nick, and for all of us, you know, the, the dream is drive a Formula One, be a Formula One driver, and then you get it for a couple of races, and you get kicked out brutally. Um, it's so harsh mentally, uh, and you saw it on his social media that he just went black out on social media and just came with a short statement and said, "Hey, sorry, I need time for myself." You know, it's it's painful. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, but that's the way it is sometimes, I guess. Yeah, human level, there's just huge, uh, yeah, sympathy with with going through that process so publicly. It's it's not. It's nice. like if it's like, yeah, it's like if you met tomorrow, uh, Sky calls you up and says, "Hey, Matt." Uh, you're just not good enough. Yeah, uh, brutal, horrible. Um, yeah. Uh, you're you're yeah. getting you're getting kicked out, and it takes you by surprise as well, yeah. kind of. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I, that's that's the same it's the same feeling. And then add a hundred million people watching yeah. that. Yeah. So hundred million people watching Sky telling you publicly, "Hey, Matt, you're just not good enough. Please leave uh, leave the team. Uh, go go home." Horrible. Matt. This this um, can be quoted. That, this that can be, be quoted for. out of context, can't it? <laughs> 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 um yeah no not not nice at all and yeah i I'd say huge huge amount of sympathy in in that scenario um just want to just want to quickly look ahead nico to, to belgium this week this weekend what are your expectations is is it hard to look past another another red bull dom domination there yeah um probably but at the same time there can be surprises in belgium we've always seen that there can be real surprises and probably the team that has a chance to surprise will be mclaren um, maybe someone like Ferrari in qualifying or something because I don't see uh, Mercedes I don't see at all because they have no straight line speed or very little um, for now and uh, and then Aston I think somehow are a little bit on the back foot but I, I would put it to McLaren to do a to do a big surprise that'd be great yeah I hope I hope after the red Perez is charged this weekend that we can see him and him and Max at least have battle out some laps I think he he'll have got great confidence from Hungary and if he can take that into into next week hopefully we can see uh red bull mclaren shoot out which would be which yeah. would be nice L last yep. race of course before before the summer break right final two things uh i've got a question here for nico from andrew where did you get that shirt that you wore on yesterday's show nico i liked it. i liked it a lot you know i was sat there at home i thought it's a good shirt <laughs> so what you don't know is i had the full outfit uh, in the morning because i have the matching silk shorts wow um and I was asking the Sky Boss Billy, can I can I pull it off? Do you allow me to? And he was like, if you feel comfortable, go ahead. But I, I chickened out, I chickened out, and I put a long long pant on to go with it. So actually, it's my it's my Ibiza Ushuaia party party wow. night shirt. Yeah, <laughs> it's from a vintage from a vintage shop next to our ice cream parlor in Ibiza, which our ice cream is called Vivi's Creamery, Vivi's Creamery in the old town, and we're like number one uh, ice cream now in Ibiza. And, and it's from the vintage shop next door. So, but uh, yeah, I like to start pushing a bit of boundaries on the fashion front. Look great. Maybe we'll see the shorts shorts next weekend with a different shirt. Epic. I guarantee you, with the shorts and the combination is epic. <laughs> but I didn't. I, I chickened yeah. out. I when you got out. on the bus in the morning, there were some whoops, weren't there? And and and, and some more exactly. whistles, I think, amongst us. Yeah. Exactly. 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 <laughs> like it was like. Yeah. What? You look great. You look great. Um, and then the final thing, which uh, Liam, you you brought this to my attention today because I Nico, I've got yeah, to know. Go on. I have to know. I'm one for sport curses. It was the Drake curse for a little bit. Have you seen the Nico Rosberg F1 curse that's been going around on Twitter? Yeah, that's not cool. Yeah, that's not cool at all. Because <laughs> um, I just I post like on race weekends, I just post a, a picture from the pit lane with some with a, with a car or something, and and that car has then gone pretty poorly. So uh, I need to uh, be be careful with that in future. <laughs> yeah, you've got um, the next few weeks are really big because if you if you post another picture next weekend and the team or the driver perform bad it's gonna just keep getting bigger and bigger yeah that's why i need to put uh put the pause button i'm not doing that anymore. yeah you can do a carousel of every driver and then you you can't you can't get blamed yeah yeah, yeah, yeah either way yeah so the back of the back story here is that on saturday i posted max's car and uh, of course he lost the qualifying and then on sunday i was like go mercedes and i posted lewis's car um <laughs> and that went completely that went completely wrong so that's the back story behind this yeah no pressure no pressure nico powers <laughs> the nico curse uh yeah it was a, it was a lot of talk of that on uh, on social media over the weekend uh right okay liam thank you for your time nico thank you very much for your time as well uh, much appreciated and we will be back on the podcast next tuesday to look back at the belgian grand prix the final race before the summer break so we hope you can join us next tuesday Day. Bye for now. Sky Sports F1. Feel it all.